Welcome to the Francisca Show podcast on jewishcoffeehouse.com, the show where I give a voice to Jewish issues, topics, and people. I'm Francisca, your host. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few things with you. We got some awesome feedback on this past series. I want to mention one of the messages I received and quote, this last episode spoke about everything and nothing at the same time, end quote. I found that to be interesting and somewhat accurate as well, potentially. So I am open to exploring these topics more and going in deeper. I also want to note that I got Shlomo's full permission. He listened to this episode before he gave his permission to put it out there. So yes, there will be a lot of aggressive criticism to what Shlomo said in his episode. So check that one out if you haven't yet. But Shlomo has listened to this and approved and knows that this episode's coming out. So for all of the sensitive people out there, please have in mind, he is on board with this. See you in the discussion group. Enjoy this episode. Welcome back, Franz Dance, to The Francisca Show. Today's going to be an episode I am very excited about because this is a direct response to a previous episode we did recently. I would like to introduce our guest, psychotherapist Anna Sherman. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about who you are and why we're having this conversation today. Thank you. Okay, I'm a registered psychotherapist practicing in Toronto, Canada. I work with individuals, couples, and families. I have a couple of specialties in couples counseling and perinatal mental health, which is to do with new mothers and expectant mothers. And I work with many individuals who are experiencing anxiety, depression, relationship issues. And my main approach is to do with attachment trauma and attachment styles, which is not the topic of today's conversation, but I will touch on it a little bit. So the episode, the first part of the men's approach, definitely a great topic to be covering. And I think that the approach was very good and well-meaning, but there were definitely a number of issues that came up while listening to the episode that I just felt were not so accurate and probably not so helpful for a lot of the listeners. That would be my opinion. But to be fair, your guest did start by saying that everything that he mentioned was based on his own experience. So as a marriage coach, that might be his experience. I'm just not sure that the approach that he's taking to help everybody is going to be long-term the most effective. And tell us about your religious background. My religious background, I grew up, I guess you could say I'm like a long-term Balchuba, but like very long-term. Like I became religious at the age of 14. Basically grew up just from the time I was 14, like keeping Shabbos, Kashras, and then went to a very mainstream seminary. And now I'm married to a very from guy and we have two daughters who go to a religious school. We live in a very from neighborhood in Toronto. And so I'm definitely very familiar both personally and professionally with many areas of the Orthodox community. I work with very yeshivish people. I work with modern Orthodox people. And I and a lot of girls who grew up or young women who grew up in the Beit Yaakov system. And I see a whole range. And I also did live in Israel in some very from neighborhoods. And I also experienced a lot of the life that goes on there. And Obviously, I'm still from, so I'm still living it. And I believe, I definitely believe in living a from life for me and my husband. That's a choice that we make. But there are definitely issues that come up within the community that I always try and help my clients the best way that I can. And the way that the school systems and community resources are dealing with a lot of these issues, in my experience, are not always the most effective or healthy. Not always. There are many that are and many that are not. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'll add to it saying how the reason we're doing the series on the male perspective, which was really hard to do, even though so many people requested it, was because men weren't really willing to come on and talk about that personal stuff. But I was able to group a few men together and some people reached out after I started releasing them expressing either frustration or criticism. So I'm very happy to be doing a follow-up. 
it's great to be doing the follow, but I'm so ha- happy you're qualified. But you're a woman. Again, we're bringing it, the female perspective on the male's perspective, which is fine if we have to continue the conversation. We do. I know we did the pro and anti-mask debate a while back. We like to cover things and just give voices to everyone. So I'm happy we're continuing this conversation. Thank you for volunteering yourself and your expertise. So let's get started. I will say, though, as a clinician who works, I would say on my on the average week of work, I would say like maybe 50% of my clients are Jewish and 50% are many other backgrounds, not just not Jewish, a variety. And within my career or journey, going back to when I was a graduate student and then a qualifying psychotherapist, we, we always have to seek out mentors for ourselves. And some of the mentors that I align myself with the closest with who I still check in with on a regular basis, and I'm still consulting all the time, who I really owe them so much of my success are from male therapists. And I always say to them, like, I've learned from the best. I really owe so much gratitude to you. They're men and they're from, and this is who I learned from. (laughs) And so I could tell you that if they were sitting with me now in this interview as well, they'd be saying very similar things that I'm saying as well. They'd be very much in line with my mindset. So if you're looking, if you want to know if there are men, yes, I am a woman saying this, but if you want to know if there are men within the community that are also like-minded in this way, trust me, there are. I don't think it's necessarily to do with men, women. I think it's to do, I think it's just to do with approach, approach to how we see men and women, whether we are a man or a woman, and we see relationships and how we interpret what marriage is and what it's all about. Let's start with the first thing that raised a flag for you. I won't color the flag. (laughs) The first thing that raised a flag for me would be, Okay, there was a lot that he said that I do agree with. So give an example of something you agreed with. So for example, when he says the man is supposed to be the shefa within the relationship. Okay, so there, this is sourced. Okay, and a lot of it is sourced. Shefa meaning abundance. Now there is a concept in Judaism that it is the husband's responsibility to be, let's say, supervising or in charge of responsible for the family's parnasa. That does not mean he needs to be working, but it does mean that he needs to figure out how we're going to put food on the table. And in families, like you had mentioned, like in a Kolo family where the husband is learning all day and the wife is working. So she's the one, she's the breadwinner in families like that. However, the husband's not just supposed to check out And just say, okay, you show me the paycheck and you take care of everything. And my job is just to be in Kola learning. That's really a decision that they should be making together. And you did touch on that in the episode. And I think it was pretty well explained. That is a decision that should be made together. If it's the decision of the couple that he wants to be learning and she wants him to learn, then they do need to figure out together how they're going to support themselves and God willing their family. And that's a wonderful concept. And then he also brings in the whole concept of that, like Shefa, he provides the seed. And then she takes it and she turns it into a baby during gestation. And then she's the one who gives birth. And that's very true. However, in my opinion, that does not translate to that we have to label the husband as the leader. And we need to always treat him as the leader. And I think that was something that you expressed frustration with as well, is that there are opportunities within every marriage for one partner to lead in some areas and the other partner to lead in other areas. And although we do have this concept of men providing shefa, we also have many concepts of women being <laughs> leaders in, in in Judaism. And we also have many sources for it, like that a woman should be an azer connecto, that she should be a helpmate that works against him. That's a concept where a wife is actually being intuitive into what her husband needs and pushing him to be a better version of himself. There's also like the whole idea of the Akara Sabais being a bedrock of the home. That's the woman's position. She's the bedrock of the home, not him, that she keeps the foundation. And he relies on her for a lot of this. That is also a very big position of leadership, the whole Isha style. Like the Isha style is a savvy businesswoman. And it's written in <laughs> that source that she is a business. She does make money and she goes into the marketplace and she sells her words. And her husband loves and respects her for it. And he's proud of her 
for being able to do that. And he respects her for it. That's also a form of leadership. The wisdom of a woman builds the health. Other sources of where we are looking to women for answers and for leadership. I understand what he's saying in that it's important to be careful in certain situations not to emasculate your husband. Emasculating your husband or emasculating a man will not result in anything positive. So the opposite is never going to help either. Masculine has to say, I'm the one that brings home the Parnassa and you just go to cool and you just learn all day and yada, yada, yada. That's never good. And if that is the dynamic, then that couple needs to sit down together or with a clinician with a third party and they need to redefine how they're going to structure their family because that's never a good dynamic to be living by. However, if she really wants to be married to a learning man, and she supports him in that, encourages him, and he wants to be learning, then that is an equal partnership that they're doing together. He loves and respects what she's doing in terms of providing for the family and having a job and having Pernessa. And then she, in turn, gives the same to him. But that's a partnership. He says the man is supposed to be a mashpia, a giver, and to make his wife's dreams come true. And that's a very nice concept. But for most women... Their dream is not to jump into a marriage and then look to their husband for all the answers. Most women want a partner. Their dream is to have a, a true life partner who is going to listen to them, validate their feelings, do their best to understand them, even if they can't, they want them to do their best and build on emotional intimacy with them as well. Not just, oh, we're getting married and now I have a leader and he's going to make all my dreams come true. That concept in and of itself, it's very invalidating. But also everything is the tone. But I like the perspective from leader to partner. <laughs> it resonates more with me personally. Okay, let's move on yeah. to the next thing. <laughs> so let's see. He says most Men are not in a position to do this naturally. They're not connected enough to themselves. I also think that most men are not really in a position, at the beginning at least, to really understand their wives the way that their wives want to be understood. But I don't think it's healthy to say it practically and spiritually. Also, I'm not sure he's bringing in all the right resources because I just brought in a whole bunch of sources which talk about women also having leadership. And there are some that say that like the men should be spiritually leading in the marriage. And there is a concept of that in many areas, the men should be spiritually leading. That's why we have Kuvay Itin. That's why we have Minyan. That's why men are obligated in all these mitzvahs and women are not. However, there is a different kind of spirituality that women have. Bina, which is also a different form of leadership. So I think maybe he's saying most men are not connected spiritually in the same way. And therefore, it's our job to encourage them to be more present and connected the way that we want it to. But that can be done through basic communication as a couple. And this is what I do with couples in my practice all the time is that if they come to me with an issue, with some of these issues, like he was saying, if they come to me that He's not listening to her or he wants like a whole reward for taking out the garbage or there's issues with physical intimacy, whatever it is. It's really, it's a lack of communication and understanding and very often a willingness to understand and giving every couple the same formula, like the surrendered wife formula. And this is a very common coaching concept. I'm not trying to bash coaches. There are some coaches who do wonderful work with people and have really helped people. There are some that have not. And I'm sure that your guest has probably helped many couples. If he hadn't, he wouldn't be in business. So I'm sure there are many people who really enjoy the work that he does with them. But one issue that I do have with coaches is that many coaches, not all, but many coaches have this one formula that they feel like this is the answer. This is the solution. Follow this template, follow this formula, and all your problems are going to go away. And the problem with that is that every couple is so different. Every individual comes from a different background with a different family of origin, with a different attachment history, with different attachment traumas. <laughs> They're all different in their birth orders. They've all had different experiences in their schools. Some have been bullied. Some have been the bullies. And now they're joining with a partner and they're trying to build a marriage. So whatever problems are coming up, there is no one solution for everybody. There's no one size fits all. You can't just apply one 
one theory and one solution to every couple. You need to go in and find out exactly what is triggering each individual and then what it is about the couple together that the communication something's getting lost in translation or somebody's not willing to hear the other person or somebody's getting triggered by the other person or they just don't have the skills. And that's what I'm here for is to help you build the skills and to understand the skills. That, in in my experience, that's how to truly help couples the most effectively so that everybody finds a deeper level of peace and happiness and contentment within the marriage. And it's more lasting, it's long-term because that's encouraging people to really understand themselves as individuals deeply and how they relate to others. And he does touch on that in the end, which I have to give him credit for is that he says that in the end, the best thing is to know yourself and to understand yourself and to love yourself and accept yourself. Those things are all true, but throughout the episode, he doesn't touch on how to do that or any kind of approaches on how to help people do that. It's all about this formula. I know many podcasts, including Headlines, Intimate Judaism, before we started recording, you mentioned Avital Chizik's Goldschmidt's article <laughs> that came out years before, right? Years before all the podcasts started talking yeah. about this. She had, it, she had it down. She was yeah. reading books before the rest of us were. Because it's nice. Let's talk more about that. It clearly is so appealing to so many people, especially within the Jewish Orthodox lifestyle. I think... Avital picks up on a, a lot of good points in her article and when she speaks about it, in that, first of all, it is a Christian concept. She puts it in her article. She's absolutely right. <laughs> I think the reason why the From World taken it and eaten it up so quickly is because it's a formula that anyone can follow and it's easy. In other words, all you have to do is follow these instructions and you don't have to do any work on yourself. You don't have to figure out your your attachment history. You don't have to look into like your family of origin, your own trauma, your triggers, your love languages, your communication styles. And you don't have to hold your husband accountable for doing any work on himself either. Why? Because you just surrender everything to him. You let him make all the decisions and you let him control all the finances and you let him tell you what to do. And the whole result is if you trick your husband into letting him think that he's in charge, He's going to give you everything that you want and you'll end up being happy. But who says that that makes women happy in the end? Maybe that will make men think something. And in your head, you say, no, really, I'm in charge. And then, and then that. Okay, I know I'm going to get a lot of. But when I read this about, this is really what I picked up on from the book. But the problem is that's not actually making anybody happy because the surrendered wife even talks about like men with addictions and men with anger issues. If you let him take charge of that's not going to solve his addiction. AA will solve his addiction. Addiction counseling will solve his addiction, but letting him think that he's in charge of your household, that's not going to get rid of his addiction. It's not going to make you happy. Letting him control the finances, that's not going to make him more attentive to you. It's not going to make him listen to you. It's not going to make him validate you. It's not going to create any kind of emotional or physical intimacy between you as a couple. That's just letting your husband feel like he's in charge and great. And you know what? At, at the end of the day, that will not work for everybody. Not only as a mess, but even in reality, that's not going to work for everybody because there are many men who don't want to be in charge of everything. They don't like that feeling. And I've had clients that I've asked them, like like male clients, who let's say like they'll suspect, oh, maybe his the wife is cheating. And I'm like, okay, it sounds like there are a lot of red blanks here, why don't you try, see if you can put a tracker on her phone or something and see if she really is. And they'll say to me, I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be that controlling husband who calls all the shots and sneaking up on my wife. Even in my own marriage, and my husband and I have been very happily married for years. And, but he, he works in finance and I'm a therapist. So a lot of times I'll go to him with something I want to buy and I'll be like, this is a large purchase. I think we really could use it in the house. Can I go and get it? And he'll just say to me, I don't want to be the financial advisor of our household. I don't want to, I don't want to be the, the yes, no guy. I don't want to be the no man because then if we don't have that thing, you're going to come back to me and say, oh, it was your decision. We have to look at our finances at our freshman and we have to decide together if this is something that we can afford for our household. So not all men really want that. And it's not going to make everybody happier. It's definitely not going to bring you closer. In a lot of ways, you might have a more functional marriage for a certain amount of time. You won't have a more fulfilling marriage. And you definitely won't be a more fulfilled individual. Definitely not. And that, unfortunately, that catches up over time. The more you repress your own needs, your own emotions, your own opinions, that will catch up 
much later on, the longer that you're practicing this whole idea of, I'm going to surrender myself. I'm going to surrender that one day, many, not all, but many women will wake up one day and say like, where the heck have I been? Like, I don't like this. I have no say in anything. This is not me. Where, what am I living here? And what am I teaching over to my children? I've seen that a lot and a lot with religious observance in Kalisha, and specifically even more for women who became from or Jewish and gave up their arts careers or passions, yeah. thinking they had to do yeah. it later, understanding they need to find an outlet for it within Judaism because it's not something they can live without. So suppressing something that's a massive part of your experience, existence is just, it's going to come out. You can do it for only a limited amount of time. So this applies right. obviously in marriage as well, where you want to have the ultimate close connection that you have <laughs> your partner right. should be the primary person you ever have a relationship that close with and really your partner should be your closest friend and i know Thank you. i'm not trying to make anybody feel bad i know in a lot of marriages that that's not the case that that is a nice goal to have that your partner should be your closest friend and I, if we think about close friendships if you're we, if you have a girlfriend best friend that you talk on the phone with every week and get together with for your iced coffees and giggle and, and and get together and let the kids play and have play dates and make Shabbos plans with. Do you let her control your life? Does it feel good to ha have a best friend who tells you what to do with your life and makes all the decisions and decides where you're going on the play date and where you're going for your iced coffee and when you're going to talk on the phone and what you're eating on Shabbos? Does that make you happy? <laughs> it's a great question. I think it's great <laughs> Maybe that people... for some people... <laughs> Personally, for me, I'm impatient, especially with friend gatherings. To We lose so much time on trying to decide what to do. So very often, I'll just step up and say, we're doing this or this. Please vote. If you don't vote by this and this date, we're not doing this. Okay. We're having pizza. End of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then halfway through the gathering, people are like, are we having fun? This is fun. And I'm like, no, if you have yeah. to ask other people if this is fun, maybe it's not fun. Okay. <laughs> I know you wrote something called the Empowered Women's Journal. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I did write this book. You are correct. And it is available on Amazon. It's called the Empowered Women's Journal. I wrote it because a big part of what I work through with my clients is I see many women. I see men too. But I see many women in my practice through individual counseling or I see them with their husbands as couples. And a lot of what I find from individuals, but especially women, is that they, because of different ideas to do with the self, with being a woman, society, how society views women, how we end up fitting in in the workplace, in relationships, in marriages, even in motherhood, is that a lot of women don't feel the freedom to be authentic and to be themselves and actually speak their minds and actually speak their opinions. And that comes out in all these different areas of their lives that I just mentioned. And then they feel disempowered. And when you're feeling disempowered, then it's very hard to go about your life in an intentional way. And what I mean by intentional is living every day and doing and making all your decisions throughout your day with a purpose, working in a career that you really believe in, being in a relationship that you really believe in being in and see a purpose to it and you're experiencing growth within the relationship or the marriage being an intentional hands-on mother that doesn't mean you have to be a stay-at-home mom but it means when you're with your kids you're doing things intentionally you're interacting with them you're creating bonds and relationships having friendships that are intentional not just because they're convenient or because you've been friends with these people for a long time but because you're actually gaining something from it and you're benefiting and you're helping each other and you're being supportive to each other living your life in an intentional way it's very hard to live intentionally if you're not being yourself if you're not being authentic and it's very hard to be authentic if you don't feel empowered to do so and so that's why i wrote the book my approach is women's empowerment i very much believe in women's empowerment that doesn't mean i'm promoting bra burning feminism it's not to do with that women are, i'm not saying women are better than men and we should be really i'm not even saying that i'm just saying that we all have our roles men have our have their roles in life each individual man has a different role and women all have our roles as well but my point is that even with this concept that if you would ask people and say, like, do you think women are deserving of equality and of being heard and listened to, the average person would say, of course. But then so much of what we see 
in the secular world and the Jewish world is just showing that no, it, a lot of women don't feel that they can speak their minds and be authentic and feel empowered and feel strengthened in, in the environments that they're in, personally and professionally. A lot of women just don't. And if you're looking at the surrendered wife concept, that's just a perfect example of where we are, we're not empowering women to be authentic because we're talking about giving over control of everything to our husbands, letting them think that they can be in control and that they're the boss and they're the leaders when really in our heads are saying, nah, I don't agree with everything he does. I don't agree with everything he says. I don't agree with all his decisions, but I'm going to make him think that because then in the end, I'll get it all back to me because he'll be happy. And then if he's happy, I'll be happy. And that's not authenticity. So that's not being true to ourselves. I want to go back to just in defense of coaches, because you said not all coaches help people. And and because of the blanket statement thing, that was the argument that you brought up, is that they have this blanket formula and it... No, not all. Listen, there are some many coaches who I've met were fantastic and they're actually really knowledgeable and they've done a lot of learning and they understand a lot of deep and complicated concepts to do with attachment, to do with love languages, to do with communication styles. There are some amazing ones. If you want to a name of a really good coach to follow, Alea B. Coaching. It's fantastic. She's a wealth of knowledge. She's fantastic. So there are many that are fantastic. There are many who are not. <laughs> but listen, it's the same with therapists. There are many right, fantastic where therapists I was getting out there at. too. <laughs> there are many not fantastic therapists. There are many terrible therapists who really mess people up. My, my problem is that with coaching, many coaches, although their intentions are good, some of them, they latch on. They latch onto a certain principle and then they truly believe that principle is the solution to everybody's problems. So it becomes very formulaic. And that's, unfortunately, that's not how, that's not how it works. And the reason I brought this back up is not to bash coaches and not to defend coaches or therapists. I want to just put it out there that if anyone is working, let's say, with a therapist or a coach, and it's not working, it might just not be good shidduch. So just keep looking for the right person. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent okay. point. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to, you had a few more things that you wanted to address about that episode. Okay, so the whole point about Nita, I'm really sorry to say, but he could not be further from the truth. <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> So wrong. So what he says in what he says in the interview is that the better the marriage is, the harder Nita is going to be for the couple, and the more it's going to suck. And marriages that are, and he's saying marriages that are not so great, where the couple is lacking in intimacy and communication, a lot of times the wife can't wait to be in Nita because she doesn't want to have to work at that intimacy, that physical intimacy with her husband. Wrong. Sorry. <laughs> I don't agree with that at all. And it's not been my experience in all my years of practice. It's not been my experience. It, there are cases in his defense where certain men are sexually aggressive and are not attentive or intuitive to their wife's needs. And in those cases, many women can't wait to be in need of because then they don't have to feel like they're being coerced into some sort of sexual aggression that doesn't feel right to them. There are some cases like that. Those are not the majority. In, let's say, a marriage that's struggling communication-wise, like all the random things that you mentioned in the podcast, not taking out the garbage, not listening, not being attentive, not caring about her feelings, those kinds of issues that come up in the marriage, like lack of communication, lack of emotional intimacy, most, in my experience, most of those couples have a very hard time with Nita. Why? Because the physical intimacy is like the one thing that's making them feel close because they're not feeling close in most of the other aspects of their marriage. They're not feeling emotionally close. They're not feeling intellectually close. They're not talking much. When they are talking, they're not understanding each other. They're fighting. They're arguing. They can't figure it out. So what can they figure out? Oh, go to the bedroom <laughs> and we'll feel better. We'll feel close again. And everything just feels right. And so that's the one thing that they're clinging on to. And then they go into Nita and they don't have that. And this is what they described to me. 
we feel cold, distant. He gets distant. He passes me in the hallway and doesn't even say hi. And I feel like I don't have a husband. And those couples have a very hard time with Nita. Couples who have excellent communication, who talk, who make a really big effort to understand each other, to learn each other's love languages, to understand each other's triggers, attachment styles. Those couples, maybe Nita's not the most fun time in their marriage, but usually they have, it's like fine. <laughs> it's Nita's, it's two weeks of the month. Let's make the best of it. And the other two weeks, then we can be together. And if you're approaching Nita or you're experiencing Nita in a way that like you're just avoiding your spouse, hating it, dreading Nita, and then hating the entire Nita period where we can't be physically intimate with your spouse and you can't show physical affection and you're just avoiding each other, then in my opinion, you're misunderstanding the whole point of Nita. Like it's not just Nita's, in my opinion, it's not a hook. It's not a mitzvah that we're not supposed to understand. There's a lot of deeper understanding to it. And when the couple is in Nita, that's a great opportunity to talk and to laugh and to make each other laugh and to tell jokes and to bond on what's going on in your week and to set goals and to go over your monthly finances and to plan your next vacation and to have Shabbos guests and hang out with your friends and play games with your kids all together. Like it's a great time to bond in so many other ways. And it's a huge part of building emotional intimacy and building blocks in your marriage. And then after you've had two weeks of laughing and talking and discussing and planning, you can go to the Mecca and you can have a mini honeymoon every month and you get back together physically. But if you're spending those two weeks of Nita just like avoiding each other and being cold and distant and you go to the Mecca, how much fun is it to connect physically with somebody who you've had no emotional connection with for the last two weeks? That's a difficult transition, unless you're connecting out of desperation, which is yeah. also not healthy <laughs> and doesn't always last. So I appreciate these comments. I think they're deserved. There's one thing that I did want to address, which is, I think one of, one of the issues, and this is also why I wrote my book about empowered women, but I think this is something to bring up with for men as well is that the whole idea of like making your husband feel like a leader and then the surrendered wife theory and women repressing their own needs, a lot of that also comes from generations of unhealthy tropes that we tell ourselves, which is men are like this. Men are man children. Men are emotionally unaware. Men don't naturally feel good about themselves. Men are naturally immature. Men don't pick up on these things. And then on the flip side, there's this trope of the unhappy wife trope. Women are, are never happy. Women are always complaining. Women are nags. And so like when we go into relationships with these tropes, then it's like the average couple may just expect, like we just expect men to not realize that they're supposed to do this. Or we expect that men are going to be children. We expect that men are men children. At, and then we expect women to be complainers. When in reality, there's really no basis to this. Men actually are, <laughs> are smarter than we give them credit and they can figure out how to take out the garbage on their own and they can figure out how to be emotionally present. They're not children. They're actually intelligent adults. And women, we don't have to be unhappy complainers. And so a lot of times what happens is if we go into relationships with these ideas that these tropes are normal and we go for years and years treating men like babies, then men will start acting like babies. And we go for years and years treating women like unhappy complainers, women will just get used to being unhappy complainers. When in reality, it doesn't have to be that way. And that's not the nature of all men and women. These are just unhealthy messages that become self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah, because, exactly. The problem is now is that a lot of women are not staying, are not willing to stay in, in marriages where these tropes exist, where these, because they don't want to be complainers. A lot of women are finding out that they don't feel good being complainers and they don't have to be unhappy. They don't want to be unhappy and they don't want to be married to man children. So this can go on for years and years. And then all of a sudden she wants to leave and he's shocked. He's absolutely shocked. Because what do you mean? I've been saying I've been unhappy for years. Yeah, but women are supposed to be unhappy. No, that's just <laughs> an unhealthy message that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, and we heard about that on the 
why I didn't want to give my get episode where he said it was a complete shock when his wife wanted a divorce. And yeah. I did not know yeah. that because in my experience, the women who asked for divorces or got divorced were unhappy for the longest time and were talking about it for the longest time. But that message yeah. wasn't received as we have to do something about it or else. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that was yeah, that was an excellent interview you did. Thank you. We have a few more minutes. I'm just wondering what other nuggets can we get from you while we have you on? I think his response, finding a way to respect the other person, he brings in some very good points, but it is really important to have a mutual respect. It is really important to practice self-acceptance, self-love. These are all excellent points that he brings in. The problem is all his focus then seems to be on making the man feel like a leader. So like I said at the beginning, his intentions are great. His solution is not that effective. And if you look at my approach, what I mean, I'm not trying to I'm not trying to glorify myself as a clinician. I'm just <laughs> like him. I'm speaking from my own experience with working with my own clients and my own couples who come to see me in my practice is that I use approaches like emotionally focused therapy, attachment styles, the Gottman method. And these are all these are all modalities that help identify patterns that every couple ex is experiencing based on their situation. These approaches all go into the actual emotions that everybody's feeling, both the primary emotions that each of the couple is feeling, the secondary emotions. So in other words, like she might be feeling angry, but under the anger is actually sadness. He might be feeling frustrated, but under the frustration might actually be a lot of self-loathing and self-doubt, and he doesn't know how to get in touch with that. There's so much that goes into every couple and every marriage and every we call it the dance that every couple does because every couple has different steps to the dance. Every every couple has different patterns within their relationships. So no, again, no one couple can really fit one exact formula. And that's why, although I think the approach was great in terms of what the intent should be, the solution is just never that simple. So let's say somebody's listening to this episode and thinking to themselves, the surrendered wife actually really... I, I won't go as to say fixed or solved my marriage problems, but really enhanced my marriage. Mm -hmm. Going back to what we talked about before, are they suppressing things that will come out eventually? Meaning, are they, is that a short-term solution? Or for people who are actually so grateful for this method that did work for them, can they feel like they're in a safe space and they could continue with this solution or with this tool? My answer to that is always, and it doesn't even matter what we're talking about, is that if it works for you and you're not hurting anybody, you do you. <laughs> so if you're finding that you're doing the surrendered wife approach and you're loving it and it saved your marriage and you're happy and he's happy and you're not hurting anybody and your kids are thriving, then just ignore everything I'm saying. Clearly, we're not a good match. <laughs> You would, me and these people would not be a good match. But if it is working for you in a way that like your marriage is now, like the wheels are turning, you're going through the motions without having any major blowups, but you're feeling doubtful about yourself, you're feeling worse about yourself, or you're just feeling you're questioning a lot about your own identity, who you are, what it is you really want, then to me, that's a red flag. And to me, that that's when we start teaching women codependency, that it's a good idea to be codependent, right? Because then you're sacrificing everything for this other person. And then who are you? Who are you anymore without this man in your life? Who are you? What's your identity? What are your opinions? What do you like? And I've met wives in my office. They can't tell me what they like. They know what their husbands, they know what their kids like. They know what their coworkers like, what their friends like. They don't know what they like. I'm like, what would you want to do? I have, they have no idea. They have no idea because all of their opinions and energy and likes and dislikes have been sacrificed for the sake of making their husbands happy and surrendering all their needs to their husbands and children. Yeah. And it, are things generally working? Are the wheels going round? Yeah, they are. But she's feeling miserable. She's the oil. She's the oil, but she's feeling miserable. And whether he knows it or not, it doesn't matter because there's the unhealthy wife trouble. It's like, oh, but women are always unhappy. There's, they always have something to complain about. So of course she's feeling miserable. Yeah. And Laura Doyle, the author of The Surrendered Wife, talks about how it was the beginning. Like this method transformed 
their relationship and ultimately they did seek or whatever issues there were ended up resolving themselves or with work with the healthy tools out there. Meaning that was the first, the stepping stone that created that paradigm shift in that marriage to be that stepping stone toward the longer term solutions and tools that they needed to create to save the marriage. I think we covered everything we wanted to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anna, You're welcome. Great to have you on today. And I love the back and forth, the conversation, the engagement. So I appreciate that we were able to continue the conversation because for me, it ended in the air. I didn't feel like there was there was this opinion. <laughs> I didn't have what to say back without if i could comment on that the this the feeling that I, I think probably a lot of people got is that you were not getting your questions answered i feel like you were asking a lot of questions in the interview and he was coming back with his formula again because that's what works and when you challenged him deeper in that formula the answer was well there are halakhic sources then there are kabbalistic sources but i'm not going to get into it okay but francisco's still not getting your questions answered and that you I had to end eventually <laughs> What? And the interview had to end eventually. So we and were. And then you had to end. <laughs> but then, of course, it was frustrating because you still didn't get your questions answered because he just kept coming back to you with the same formula. And again, I'm sure his formula works for many people that he sees or that come to see him. But it wasn't working for you because it wasn't getting your questions answered. Because anytime you deviate from the formula, he comes back with the same formula. Okay, and now I officially feel bad because we threw him under the bus, even though that was the intention was to continue the Not conversation. Not intention at all. Like, I, I, again, he brings up ex some excellent points. His intentions in terms of what he wants to accomplish with marriage coaching are wonderful. And he brings up excellent points in terms of that a couple should be more connected and self-love and self-acceptance. And that is the foundation for any good relationship. Absolutely getting to know yourself better. Those are all excellent points that he brings up. The tools and how to get there, I would have to disagree with him. However, he has a business. So obviously there are people that are appreciating the work that he does. And I respect him for that. I just don't agree. It's not my approach. And it probably wasn't yours either <laughs> because you weren't getting your questions answered. But I'm sure that there are many people that he's helping and they're probably doing better. And that's why they come to him. So just to him for all the work that he does. And for the sake of the privacy of my life, who knows if that approach works for me or not. My job as the host of the show is to ask the questions. So I just had to stick with my job. I'm not taking sides. Right. And I appreciate all our guests who come on and really take the risk of saying what they believe in out there into the mic for me to post everywhere and to be scrutinized by someone like you, potentially. And we'll see what happens <laughs> after this. I feel a little bit bad because we threw Shlomo under the bus. <laughs> Can we expand a little bit on what the nature and the purpose of this conversation was? Yeah, this conversation is not meant to throw anybody under the bus by any means. I totally respect and value everything that Shlomo is doing. And like I said at the beginning of the podcast, he brings in excellent points. I truly think his intention is to, is to really truly help people and, and help people improve their marriages and quality of lives. I think anytime somebody go and I've been on many podcasts as well, I, I think anytime you, you agree to go on a podcast and talk about an approach, it can be controversial and you are going to get people that love what you have to say and agree with you. And then you are going to get people that, that disagree with certain points, but it's all, the disagreement is all just meant as constructive criticism and not as attacking or putting anyone down or minimizing anyone or infantilizing anyone. Not a, it's nothing to do with that. I think that constructive criticism can always be helpful for every single one of us in improving the work that we do and the people that we are. I think we can always take constructive criticism and implement it into our lives, implement it into our jobs and into our careers and the work that we do. And hopefully Shlomo can hear some of my points and and uh, maybe appreciate some of the <laughs> nuggets of wisdom that I bring in from my own experience and possibly take some different approaches when he's working with his clients and incorporate new ideas and maybe do a little reading on some of the things that that I brought up just to expand on the work that he does. And if it doesn't work for them, that's fine too, because it sounds like he's got a good practice and there are a lot of clients that are benefiting from his work. So anyways, I think it's all just about constructive criticism and supporting one another in that way. So thank you for using your voice 
for sharing your expertise and your experience with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening until the end. If you have what to say, please join the discussion group. Let's continue the conversation there. If you would like to volunteer to share your side, your perspective, please do reach out. Let's talk about that. If you enjoyed the show, you probably will enjoy the other podcasts on Jewish Coffee House Network. Check them out as well. They are linked in the show notes. I have been working on an instrumental electronic spin on the Yamam Noraim tunes and Nagunim. And hopefully, God willing, I will be releasing four tracks this or next week instrumental so men and women can both enjoy it it is probably geared more toward the younger generation because of their love for electronic music however if you are millennial or older you might enjoy it as well let me know and this week i am turning the big three and zero both in the hebrew calendar and the english calendar so i feel the new year more than ever. I want to wish you a beautiful new year. And I pray for myself and for you that we all get to live another beautiful year full of health, joy, and that we are able to fulfill our potential. This podcast is one of my true joys. And thank you for being with me on this journey. Thanks to all my sponsors, supporters, cheerleaders, and collaborators. Shana Tova, see you next year.